to. You slept beneath the stars you named and numbered. Were tempted in a desert you designed. You faithfully obeyed the law you authored. The king left his throne behind. You washed the feet of those who called you the multitudes with truth and bread. You shared the feast with harlots and with sinners, and loved those who sought your death. Gloria. So <clears throat> let's um, kind of make a little bit of a break there. So like you share the feast with harlots and with sinners and love those who sought your death glorious. So like love those oh, and love those who sought your death glorious. you bore the bitter cross the innocent received our condemnation and paid for the rebels cause you were buried. The word of life was silenced by the grave. But doors of death could not contain your glory. Our God rolled the stone away. two hard ones, so I think we're good. <clears throat> I've got
Good morning. Good morning. This happens every time the weather gets a little cooler for whatever reason. You guys get rambunctious. So it's good to see you this morning. Welcome you to our gathering of Holiday Bible Church. Uh, we are so glad you're here. We're so glad you've chosen to uh, join with us, worship with us together on this Sunday morning. Uh, we do have a few announcements for you. Uh, one is this Wednesday is our quarterly family meeting. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, so this is the third quarter family meeting, even though the fourth quarter is almost over. Uh, but we're getting caught up. So this is our third quarter family meeting. It will be held via Zoom, uh, as the, the prior one has been and as our Wednesday nights have been recently. So uh, this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, if you don't have the link to that Zoom meeting, uh, send me a message, let me know. We'll get that out to you. We'll try to post it perhaps in the Facebook group page as well. So you have it there. Also, uh, this coming Sunday at 5 o'clock is our annual Christmas party, uh, gathering, fellowship, dinner. I don't know what we call it, but we're going to get together to celebrate and uh, have a good time around a meal. So we'll call it a, a Christmas dinner, 5 o'clock here in this room. Uh, and like last year, the only thing we're going to ask you to bring uh, is a dessert, so if you were here last year, we had uh, just an overwhelming number of desserts, and it was, uh, was mind-numbing. It was amazing. We all left with uh, sugar rushes and crashed later, and uh, we've been struggling with that the rest of the year, right? So we're going to do it all again uh, because it was, it was fabulous. So we want to direct our attention that way uh, because what else is this time of year for, right? It's to eat good food. That's probably not good for you. Uh, but that is this Sunday. December 13th at 5 o'clock. If you have any other questions, again, let us know. Uh, we do want to direct our attention to worship this morning. Uh, we want to do that through the Psalms. Psalm 119, which we've been working our way through. Starting in verse 49, the psalmist writes, Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord. And keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. I think it's amazing, maybe even a little bit shocking to us, that the psalmist would say such things about law, the requirements of God, the commands that he gives, that they are his comfort, and keeping them is our blessing. but it is because they are from a good and righteous God who has come to redeem His people and desires to bless us. His words are life to us. And it is that word that we want to give our attention to this morning in all that we do, what we sing and what we say. And let's bow and let's focus on that word this morning. Let's focus on the God of that word as we prepare our hearts to sing and to praise Him. Let's bow to pray together. Lord, we are thankful for Your Word. We are thankful that You have revealed Yourself to us through it. We are thankful that it is to us life and health. That it reveals to us eternal life. That it alone can give us that life. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside all of the distractions of the week, the Christmas season that comes with its own uh, 
busy schedule, demands on our time, and Lord, for many, even demands on our emotions. God, we pray that we would fix our attention on you. We pray that you would be honored. We pray that your son would be magnified. We pray that the power of your spirit would be present. And God, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Stand please to sing. Christ the Lord, the eternal Son of God, took on human flesh to bear our sin and shame and die in our place. And for this reason and so many more, he is glorious. You slept beneath the stars. You slept beneath the stars you named and numbered. Were tempted in the desert you designed. 
you faithfully obeyed the law you authored. The king left his throne behind. You washed the feet of those who called you master fed the multitudes with truth and bread. You shared the feast with harlots and with sinners, and loved those who sought your death. Gloria. Lord, you are glory. Shepherd and King, forever you'll be glorious. Without a word, without a word, you face the accusations, and joyfully you bore the bitter cross. The innocent received our condemnation and paid for the rebel's cost. Gloria, Lord, you are glorious, shepherd and king forever. fashioned you were buried the word of life was silenced by the grave but doors of death could not contain your glory our God rolled the stone away glory seated. Our scripture reading this morning through the book of Mark is in chapter 11 verses 27 through 33. Mark 11 27 through 33 says this. And they came again to Jerusalem and as he was walking in the temple the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another saying, If we say from heaven... He will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, 
We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus, obviously with the authority of God Almighty, was able to do amazing signs and wonders. The angels on that night in the fields outside of Bethlehem announced this amazing message, not to the nobility, not to the royalty, but they announced the message to shepherds who were keeping watch over their flock by night. Uh, This next song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, uses some language that we're not familiar with. And so on the car ride this morning, uh, the song came on the radio and my kids asked me, what does Hark the Herald Angels Sing mean? What does it mean? And uh, the word hark means listen. Listen to the message that the angels are singing to those shepherds. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth from Isaiah 9. And mercy mild God and sinners reconciled. So let's try. I know you've probably sung this song a thousand times in your life. Maybe more. But try as we go through this song again to really focus on these words. And uh, try to understand the original message that the author was trying to communicate when he wrote, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hark the by highest heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord late in time behold him come offspring of a virgin's womb veiled in flesh the Godhead see the 
life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. <laughs> I'm in the wrong key. That's what I'm doing wrong. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lives. love you give light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath in our love
all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. shout your praise, you realize you, you are the beginning of the fulfillment of that promise. And what we do here this morning is the guarantee that that promise will be fulfilled. Amen? We're going to pray um, one more time before Mike comes to present God's word to us. Let's pray together. Lord, we have read of your glory. We have sung of your glory. We are humbled by your glory. And so, Lord, now as we come to your word to hear the proclamation of it, we ask once again that you would show us your glory, that you would be exalted in our eyes, that Christ would increase, that we would decrease that we would grow in our dependency upon him. That what remains in us of rebellion would be put down. That every thought of ours would be brought under the captivity of Christ. Lord, we pray that you would be exalted in the eyes of your people. Lord, we pray for those who are not here with us this morning. It has been a challenging year as far as our fellowship goes. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with them. We pray that you would keep them even as they are apart from us. Lord, we pray for those who are being tempted this morning to drift away. Those who have grown comfortable in their complacency. Those for whom the glory of Christ has been diminished. God, would you draw them back to yourself? Would you call them out of their confusion out of their chaos and show your love to them. Restore them once again. Lord, we pray for Mike. We thank you for his preparation, which we know begins years prior to any message that is preached. We thank you for the work that you have done in his heart through what he has studied. We pray that you would speak to us, knowing that these are your words. Lord, may we be edified by them. 
Build up your people. Save those who are lost. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. About two and a half years ago, my wife and I um, purchased a house in Clearwater, Florida. We had a particular neighborhood that we had our eye on for several months in advance, and one of my friends lived in the neighborhood, and we visited him often and just loved the area, and we knew that's where we wanted to move, but the houses in that area were at such a level that we knew we would never be able to afford a move-in ready home, so we were looking for fixer-uppers. My wife and I enjoy watching the show Fixer Upper and Hometown and all the other shows about those two crazy people who buy a house that is completely trashed and they gut it and they remodel it and make it their own. And we thought, it only takes them like 25 minutes to do that. (laughs) And that's how long the show is. How hard can it be? And I mean, they, you know, they start a project, and then the next scene is the finished product, and so we thought, this is going to be great. So we bought a house that was a major fixer-upper down in Clearwater and began the process of making that house our own. And I mean, we, we had no idea what we were getting into. We had to tear down some walls that were load-bearing and put in some beams to support the ceiling. And we had to tear out all of the drywall, which was roach-infested and just disgusting water damage. So we took everything down to the studs, and then we started basically from scratch remodeling this home and making it our own. And in the process, we wanted to create a centerpiece in the house, something that would draw everyone's attention to this piece as soon as they walked in the door. And we, by tearing down the walls, created this very open concept. And so we thought, you know what, let's put a massive bar in the middle of the the room, dividing the kitchen area from the dining room and living room area, and let's put the oven in there, the stovetop in there, and build a bunch of cabinets around it. Let's put two big uh, pillars there, two columns with, you know, electricity in them and everything, and let's make that, with the big hood and everything, the centerpiece of our home. And so that's exactly what we did. We, uh, you know, we, we remodeled the entire place, new walls, new paint, new floors, But the centerpiece of our home was this gigantic island um, with uh, seating on one side and the oven on the other side uh, to draw people's attention to that centerpiece, right? Um, Probably as I was talking, maybe came to your mind, what is the the centerpiece of your home? Maybe it's a piece of art, maybe it's a nice fireplace with a big mantle and Uh, Maybe it's your Christmas tree this time of year and you're trying to draw people into your home with this centerpiece for them to focus on. This morning, I want to talk about making Jesus the centerpiece of your life. Making Jesus the centerpiece of your life. And I want you to see from our text this morning Three reasons why you should make Jesus the centerpiece of your life from Colossians 1, 15 through 23. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Colossians near the end of the scriptures. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Amber alert. Colossians 1.15, hear the word of the Lord. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, I just wait for everyone's phone to go off. You can't silence those. You can silence most things on your phone. You can silence most things, but you can't silence an Amber Alert, I think. That's just going to happen. Uh, But you can silence most things. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord. (laughs) 
He, that is Jesus, is the Im image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is above, I'm sorry, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in, on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in minds, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you would apply its message to our hearts this morning. May we leave more like your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in His name that we pray. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. So three reasons why you should make Jesus the centerpiece of your life. Reason number one, because Jesus is Almighty God in a human body. Why should, I, why should I make Jesus the centerpiece of my life? Because he is almighty God in a human body. Look at verse 15. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, there's danger in these waters. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. There are religions uh, in our world that believe that Jesus, in, in being the firstborn of all creation, they take that to mean that Jesus was the first creation of God the Father. That Jesus, that the, the eternal Son of God is not eternal. That there was a point in time where the Son of God did not exist. Because clearly, this verse teaches that he was born, the firstborn of all creation, and folks like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness believe that Jesus is not the eternal Son of God. Rather, he is the firstborn of creation. Now, there's a problem with that, namely the rest of the context. Every other verse points to the idea that Jesus is not a part of creation. Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created. That is, there is not one thing in creation that was not created by Jesus, including himself. It says, in heaven and earth, invisible, visible, invisible, thrones, rulers, authorities, all things were created through Jesus. How many things were created through Jesus? All things were created through Jesus. And verse 17 says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Skip down to verse 19. In him, that is in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All the fullness of God includes God's eternality. Not most of the fullness of God minus his eternality, because clearly he was born at a point in time. But all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus in bodily form. So clearly this passage is not teaching that there was a point in time where Jesus did not exist and then he was the firstborn of creation. So what does Paul mean by this idea of firstborn? The idea is that Jesus as the, look at my hands, firstborn of creation is the rightful heir to inherit all things. Not that 
the Son of God became the Son at a point in time, but as the eternal Son of God, he has the right to inherit every single thing under creation. It all belongs to him as the firstborn, right? So we have to understand, in, in, in making Jesus the centerpiece of our lives, you, you have to understand some, some things about the nature of God. God is a tri-unity. We smush those two words together, tri-unity, and we take out the U and it becomes the trinity. What is the tri-unity of God or the trinity of God? What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means that God has eternally existed as one being in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each of these three distinct persons is 100% God. So the Father is 100% God. The Son is 100% God. The Spirit is 100% God. And yet, these three persons are distinct from one another so that the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Spirit and the Spirit is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit and the Spirit is not the Son. It is one being who has existed for all eternity as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so why should we make Jesus the centerpiece of our life? Because he is 100% almighty God in a human body. Jesus is God almighty. Listen to John 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, a reference to the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, that is distinct from the Father. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So here you have this person called the Word, who is with the Father, meaning he's distinct from the Father. You can tell the two apart. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, equal in every way to God the Father, inferior in nothing to the Father, equal and yet distinct from God the Father. The very next verse says, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So again, the Son is the agent of God's created universe. When God spoke the world into existence, whose mouth was moving? The Son of God. All things were made through Him and for Him. So He is the unseen God, the image of the invisible God. John 4, verse 24, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and they're talking about the correct location of worship on planet Earth. This woman was a Samaritan, and she believed, along with her people, that you ought to worship God on a certain mountain in Samaria. And the Jewish people believe that you should worship God in Jerusalem. And so she asks Jesus, hey, you look like a smart guy probably a prophet. Your people say you should worship in Jerusalem. My people say we should worship in Samaria. So tell me, where does God want to be worshipped? And Jesus says this in John 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God does not have a human body in the beginning. God is a spirit. The Father is a spirit. The Son is a spirit. The Spirit, obviously a spirit. Incorporeal, non-physical, pure spiritual. Until, John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory 
glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. And yet, Jesus becomes the physical representation of God Almighty on earth. And he lives with us. Can you imagine what that would have been like for Jesus, who is eternal and omnipresent and omniscient and all-powerful to take on himself a temporal, finite human body with all of its sickness and disease and emotional trauma and weakness? Can you imagine the eternal son becoming a human baby? And yet that's what Jesus did for us. Why should I make Jesus the centerpiece of my life? Because he is God Almighty come in a human body. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul again brings up this point of the fullness of God in a human body when he writes in Colossians 2, 9, for in Jesus the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus said it this way to Thomas when he said, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. You know, you keep talking about your Father and his house and the rooms and everything. Just show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And Jesus says, Thomas, have you been with me for so long? Three and a half years you've been with me and you still don't get it. If you have seen me, Jesus says, then you have seen the Father. Why? Because Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the image. Now, all of us as human beings share in that image of God, the imago Dei, right? We are image bearers of God, but he is, listen, the image of God. That little word, the, the image of God, expresses the idea of the image of God par excellence, the highest representation of the image of God so that we are image bearers. He is the image of the invisible God, the inheritor, the owner of all creation. And he comes in a fully human body. Listen to Hebrews 4, 15. It says, Jesus is the one who in every respect has been tempted just like we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted in every way just like we are, which means that as a human man, Jesus could temporarily limit his divine attributes like omniscience. So that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane doesn't express made up emotions. I got to act like I'm scared of the cross for these guys. No, he was terrified. So Jesus was tempted in the garden and in the wilderness, by the way, at the beginning of his ministry. Remember, Satan comes up to Jesus and Jesus was not pretending to be hungry. He really was hungry. And so when Satan says, command these stones to become bread and feed yourself by your own power and authority outside of the will of God, Jesus really was tempted to do that. When the devil takes Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and he says, hey, if you just jump off, then God's angels are going to come swooping in like a bunch of F-14s and they're going to save you before your foot even gets bruised by the ground. And then everyone who's looking will know, holy cow, this is the Lord's anointed. He can't die. He must be the Messiah. So again, Satan was saying, use your own power and authority to subvert God's will for your life. Let everyone know that you're the Messiah without having to go to the cross. And Jesus was tempted. And yet he resisted. Then Satan takes him up to the high mountain, shows him all the nations of the world and says, just hit the knee 
before me, just like two seconds, right? Just kneel, stand back up, bada bing, bada boom. I'll give you all these nations. And Jesus was tempted to do that. And yet, without sin. He resisted every temptation that came into his life. From beginning to end, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what does he pray? Lord, if possible, don't make me go through with this. And yet, he was without sin. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. So Jesus is God Almighty and fully human man in one being. He's worthy of being the centerpiece of your life. Reason number two why you should make Jesus the centerpiece of your life. Because he created everything that exists and he holds it all together. Jesus created everything that exists and holds it all together. These first two points are, as you can tell, somewhat related. Number one, Jesus created everything. Verse 16 says, For by Jesus all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So not just was creation made through him, that is, by his agency, everything was created, but everything was created for him, for his glory, for his honor, for his majesty, so that everyone would look to Jesus as the center of the universe and make him the center of their lives. Have you ever stopped to think about what it means that Jesus created everything that exists? Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 helps us to think of some specific details of creation. Isaiah 40 verse 12 says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance? Right? So let's think about that. Who has held the waters... In the hollow of his hand. What does that mean? The waters of earth. It means every ocean, every sea, every lake, every river, every stream, every mud puddle, the water that exists under the ground in the water tables. When God created all the water of the earth, he thought to himself, how much water does this place need? About that much, probably. Have you ever tried to hold water in your hand? It's tough. Unless you can get a tiny little amount of water in the hollow of your hand, the very palm of your hand, then it will stay in your hand. And God said, how much water does this planet need? Eh, About that much. Every drop of water on the planet fits in this tiny little hole in his palm, right? But not only that, the next thing says, who has measured the heavens with a span? Have you ever stopped to think how large our universe is? Hey, let's just take the Milky Way galaxy, right? The Milky Way galaxy is approximately 100,000 light years across, right? Shaped like a Frisbee, and we're towards the edge of the Frisbee, And we're looking across the Milky Way, which is why some nights on a clear night when you're not in clear water, you're somewhere out in the boonies and you can see the stars, then you see a bunch of random stars all around you, but then you see this huge swath, we call it the Milky Way. That's basically you sitting on the edge of the Frisbee looking across the Frisbee of the universe. That's the Milky Way galaxy that you live in. How big is it? 100,000 light years across. You say, what's a light year? Well, light, a light year is actually a distance, like an inch or a foot or a mile. A light year is a distance. It's the amount of space that it takes light to travel from point A to point B in 365 days. One year, how far does light travel? Well, light travels at a speed of 186,282 miles per second. 
So go 186,282 miles per second for every single second in one year, and that's a light year. And our Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 years of light traveling from point A to point B. It's massive. A light year is roughly equivalent to 6 trillion miles which means that our Milky Way galaxy is approximately 600,000 trillion miles across. And the Milky Way galaxy is only one out of approximately, the estimated guess among scientists, the Milky Way is one galaxy out of an estimated 2 million million galaxies. And God said, how big do I want to make the universe? How about that big? A span is the Jewish measurement from the tip of your tongue to the tip of your pinky. You know, about a span. I'm going to make, this microphone is about a span. The universe, maybe that big, right? The waters on earth, yeah, that looks good, right? <laughs> Jesus created... This whole thing. And it all belongs to him. Shouldn't we make him the centerpiece of our life? The one who created all things? Not only does he create all things, but it says that in him all things hold together. Verse 17. And Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews 1.3 says Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. So the reason the Milky Way galaxy and the rest of the two million million galaxies in our universe don't dissolve into nothing, the reason they hold together, the reason the earth revolves, rotates around the sun, rotates on an axis, excuse me, and orbits the sun exactly the same way year after year is because Jesus Christ upholds our universe by the word of his power. Now think about this. Think about the implications of that first night of Jesus' earthly life in Bethlehem. Here he is, six minutes old, and his mother has just finished kind of cleaning him off, and now she's holding him in her arms. It's cold outside. She wraps him in swaddling cloths, and she's holding him close to her body. And if she abandons him, he's going to die. He is completely dependent on Mary to uphold his existence. And yet, at the same time, this infant is upholding our universe by the word of his power. Her life is being upheld by his divine will as she is upholding his life with her human will. What an amazing person Jesus is. Make him the center of your life. Number three. Why should I make Jesus the centerpiece of my life? Because Jesus died to reconcile you to God. Jesus died to reconcile you to God. Look at verse 20. For through him, Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Through Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. What does reconciliation mean? I always use hand motions for my kids in my class. Reconciliation happens when there is conflict, just like this, right? Two people are upset with one another. There's a conflict there. 
Reconcili- reconciliation happens when there's a conflict and then two people are reunited like this, right? So the scriptures all over the place. I mean, look at verse 21. You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So here we are, hostile, loving sin, wanting to be our own God, wanting to make life work on our own terms. And here's God saying, I'm the sovereign Lord of the universe. Obey me, submit to me. And we say, no, I will not obey you. And God says, you must obey me. And we say, I won't. We're hostile to God. And yet, God took us in our hostility to him, and he reconciled us. He restored the relationship. I always use this illustration when I talk about reconciliation. Uh, My brother, Mark, is five years younger than I am, and I'll never forget this one uh, Christmas holiday. Uh, We were at my grandmother's house, and all the aunts and uncles and cousins were all there in her tiny little condo in Cary, North Carolina. It was very cramped, and and, uh, we're all standing around kind of talking in her living room. And all of a sudden, my brother Mark and his cousin Wesley, who were roughly the same age, come out of one of the bedrooms, and I mean they are going at it wrestling, yelling at each other. And I mean, they're little, little kids. I mean, you know, like four years old, three years old, something like that. Very small, but I mean, they're, I had it first. No, I had it. No, you played with it too long. You had it yesterday. And they're just going to town. And all of a sudden, everyone's attention is put on Mark and Wesley and their little argument, their conflict, right? So my mom goes behind Mark and kind of pulls him off of Wesley, and his mom kind of comes up to Wesley and holds him back, you know. And, and uh, my mom said, what is going on? Because he had the toy, and I wanted the toy. All right, the toy is going up. Now, you boys need to apologize to one another. So my mom said, Mark, look at Wesley and say I'm sorry. Okay. Wesley, look at Mark and say I'm sorry. Say you forgive each other. And then my mom, who wasn't convinced that actual reconciliation had taken place, said, all right, now, boys, I want you to shake hands. Well, they had no idea what she meant by that. And so both boys looked at her, and they looked at each other, and they go, what is this supposed to do? (laughs) You know? (laughs) But there was a conflict between these two boys, and then there was maybe some sort of forced reconciliation, the the reunion of the relationship, and here I am, hostile to God, doing my evil deeds, and God reconciles me to himself. How? Look at verse 21. Verse 22. And you who were doing evil deeds... Hostile in mind, verse 22, God has now, I'm sorry, Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. How did God take us from hostiles to friends, from enemies to sons and daughters? How did that happen? Through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were God's enemies. His wrath was over us, about to fall like a one-ton bomb directly on our heads. And yet, Jesus pushes us out of the way, and he takes the wrath of God. He absorbs the wrath of God for my sins on the cross. All of my wrong thoughts, all of my wrong words, all of my wrong actions were taken off of me and placed on Jesus. And the wrath of God was poured out on his son so that I could have a relationship with God for free. You were alienated and hostile and yet God has reconciled you through 
the death of his only son. Why did he do this? He did this, verse 22 says, in order to present us to God as holy and blameless and above reproach. That means no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Because of Jesus' death, my union with him means that I have died with him. Because of Jesus' resurrection, my union with him means I've been raised with him to a reproach free, holy, blameless life, which is necessary to enter into the presence of this almighty one. Jesus died to reconcile us to God. Make him the centerpiece of your life. How do we make Jesus the centerpiece of our lives? Practically speaking, I think you can do a few things that will assist you in making Jesus that center of focus in your life. Number one, learn about him in the scriptures. Get to know him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the book of Colossians on your own and think deeply about what it means that Jesus is almighty God and weak human man. Get to know Jesus in the word of God. Number two, how do you make Jesus the center of your life? Talk to him in prayer. When you've got things going on in your life and you don't know how to handle the pressure and stress and troubles of life, the heartbreak that you experience, go to him and tell him what you're feeling and what you're going through and allow him. Cast your burdens on the Lord and allow him to sustain you by his matchless power. Number three, join yourself together with other people who have made Jesus the center of their lives and worship him together in unity. Find other people who have made Jesus the center of their life and make them your community. When we spend personal, private time getting to know him through the scriptures, talking to him in prayer, and then we gather with other believers who love him just as much as we do, then Jesus will become the center of our lives. And when people enter our lives... When unbelievers meet us, their attention will immediately be drawn to that center piece in our homes that points people's attention to Jesus. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, it is our desire to make you the center of our lives. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you that your son willingly took on a human body. That he lived a perfect sinless life resisting every temptation that he was faced with. Thank you that he perfectly obeyed your commands and he earned the righteousness that we could never earn. Thank you that he willingly bore the wrath of God that we deserve to bear on the cross. Thank you that he died for our sins. Thank you that he didn't stay dead, but three days later he rose again, proving that he was the son of God in power. Thank you that he ascended into heaven and is seated at your right hand, constantly making intercession on our behalf. God, by your spirit, would you help us to make Jesus the centerpiece of our lives? We are so attracted to other things. 
and yet he is the center of the universe, and we must make him the center of our lives. So by your spirit, would you help us to that end? Keep us in your word. Keep us on our knees. Keep us together in this Christian community. You are the head of the body, the church. And we are here to worship and magnify and focus on you and you alone. Thank you for this opportunity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. amen. Remember that this Wednesday night is our family meeting on Zoom. If you need the link, you can contact Pastor Bo and he would be happy to give that to you. Next Sunday is our Christmas party. We hope that you can be there for that as well. God bless. Have a great week. You are dismissed.